Okay, this lecture is about cell communication. And here are the outcomes that we will cover. And the big picture is that cells have to interact with their environment. And they can interact with their environment through chemical signals and proteins. We've talked a lot about the cell membrane <clears throat> and transmembrane proteins. So this is my little cell membrane. We have mem proteins that cross the membrane and mostly we've been talking about transport. Moving things in and out of the cell. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about a different type of protein called a receptor. And <clears throat> excuse me, I draw my receptors like this shape. So because I'm crossing the membrane with these um, transmembrane receptors, and then receptors are very specific. And they have a very specific interaction with signaling molecules. Sorry for, I don't know why my screen does that. <clears throat> the signaling molecules are also called ligands. And a lot of times these are um, proteins, but they can also be lipid based and they can be um, smaller molecules like, <coughs> excuse me, ions as well. When we draw a receptor protein that's transmembrane, what we're showing is that there is a connection, a chemical connection. So here's my ligand signaling molecule. There's a chemical connect connection between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. There can also be intracellular receptors. The only reason I capitalize receptors, a lot of times I just write it like this, like an R. <clears throat> it does not need to be capitalized. And so you might have receptors in here that receive a signal from a molecule moving inside the cell. And we'll talk about examples of these. So let's first talk about, in general, cell-to-cell -cell communication. So all types of cells communicate, whether they're eukaryotic or prokaryotic. This is really cool. You'll learn about in microbiology <clears throat> called quorum sensing. where bacteria will actually put out these signaling molecules and tell other ones, hey, divide, come over here, make this specific kind of protein. And so this is an example of a community that talks to one another. Cell signaling is definitely important in multicellular organisms so you can have communication um, within tissue or between tissues and organs <clears throat> and not shown on this slide, but also single-celled organisms, eukaryotic, or prokaryotic, 
goodness, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Use cell communication to respond to their environment. So why do cells communicate? Big thing is respond to the environment. So for instance, this is a yeast cell. So yeast are eukaryotic cells. And <clears throat> it's producing a glucose receptor. And now there's a lot more glucose, sugar, in the environment. So the uh, yeast cell is going to take in those that glucose and then it's going to <clears throat> start manufacturing more glucose transporters so it can take more and more in. So that's a cell response to this glucose um, signaling molecule. We'll talk about what happens internally when cells um, are communicating but first we're going to talk about some of the external. Okay. Here's another example of <clears throat> responding to the environment. The cells of a plant will actually grow at different sizes. It's kind of hard to see. Let's see. Nope. I don't know why. Sometimes I can do it, sometimes I can't. Ah, stop. Um, anyways, I'll just leave that. Um, <clears throat> and so, if you can see, there's little cells here and longer cells here, and it allows the whole multi-organism um, <clears throat> shoot of the plant to bend and grow towards the light. So again, another response to the environment. I showed you back here, quorum <clears throat> sensing, so a community responding to the environment, and also <coughs> in multicellular organisms. something that's probably happening in my body right now because I've got a bit of a cold is that I have cells that are working together to fight an infection so I have cells signaling hey <clears throat> these cells are infected probably with a virus um, come kill them and these are cells are infected with a virus protect yourself so there's a lot of cell signaling happening um, in my system right now trying to get rid of this infection so like I said, we're first going to talk about the big picture of cell-cell communication. This is just a um, summary slide, but this link that I gave you is a really good resource. The Khan Academy has uh, multiple pages that describe um, cell communication, um, and there are also some videos. So if you'd like to learn more, I suggest you check out this resource. <clears throat> So the first type of um, cell communication we're going to talk about is direct intercellular signaling. So this means signals between two or more cells. And it's happening <clears throat> directly, so they're in contact. So it's telling you here that the signals can pass through a cell junction, and I'll show you what that is in a minute, from the cytosol to, of one cell to another. <clears throat> so here you're going to have intracellular receptors. Because <coughs> the signaling is not happening um, in response to the environment. <clears throat> In fact, these blue molecules, these ligands, are going to move from one cell to another. So an example of this is your heartbeat. And um, this is a pretty cool video. So what happens when your heart is going to beat is that calcium... Gray skin grows back quickly dead heart tissue does not. This is why a cardiac arrest often leads to severe long-term problems. At the Vienna University of Technology, chemical substances have been developed 
which turned the body's own progenitor cells into functioning, beating heart cells. This discovery could open the door to a new kind of regenerative medicine. The goal is to create tissue in the lab, which can be implanted without any danger of tissue rejection. So that is all happening because the cells are communicating together. So calcium is moving from cell to cell to cell, stimulating a heartbeat. <clears throat> and the way the calcium can move from cell to cell to cell are through proteins called gap junctions. So this is a protein channel. Now this is different <clears throat> than a protein channel that we talked about, like a um, like a channel. This is different, sorry, than a channel protein that we talked about for transport. This is um, multiple proteins making the channel, and the channel is connecting two cells. So you can see phospholipid bilayer of cell one here, phospholipid bilayer of a second cell, and <clears throat> these, this big tunnel connects the two cells. One thing that's important, um, so they're being able to move very small molecules like ions, um, amino acids that make up your proteins, uh, nucleotides that make up your DNA and RNA. These kinds of things can be moved um, from cytosol to cytosol between these two plant or these two cells. Sorry. And gap junctions can open and close, so there is some control. But what I want you to know is that. <clears throat> Unlike channel proteins, these are not selective. Okay, so these are truly these large spaces that whatever can fit can go across. So it's not selective. So this is how one of the ways it's different than channel proteins for transport. So whatever can fit can go through a gap junction. So once again the gap junction is for direct intercellular signaling, so signaling between these cells that are connected <coughs> together, touching, The gap junctions are not selective, but rather a tunnel that can be opened and closed, and it allows small molecules to move from cytosol to cytosol between these two cells. There is a similar um, type of um, cell, t cell to cell tunnel in plants, and though this term is not in your objectives, I will tell you it is my favorite word, and the word is plasmodesmata. So <clears throat> you don't have to know this, but you might want to if there was a, say, extra credit question. Okay. So this plasmodesmata is in plants, and remember that plants have, really I'm tired of this pen, cell walls, right? And then inside they have their cell membranes. And so the plasma desmata, <clears throat> similar to the gap junction, is connecting the cytosol, and unfortunately I can't erase what's in between here, so I'm just going to make this dark <clears throat> plasma desmata. And what I want you to see here <clears throat> is that these are big, these are big openings compared to gap junctions. So big, in fact, that <clears throat> the smooth ER can be shared between plant cells. 
the reason this is my favorite word is this is how oh, you can't see that let's see if you can see light color this is how this is my diagram of a virus this is how viruses move so plant viruses <clears throat> well, let's do this. Plant viruses travel cell to cell through the plasma desmata. So this is an example of direct intercellular signaling <clears throat> in plants. Don't have to know it, but it is my favorite word. All right, so that's direct intercellular signaling. Now let's look at contact-dependent signaling, also called juxtacrine signaling. In this case, the signaling molecule, or the ligand, is bound to the membrane of one cell, and the receptor <clears throat> is on a second cell. And contact dependent tells you the two cells must touch <clears throat> through the ligand and receptor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a way that two cells, and a lot of times these are two different types of cells, can communicate. So this ligand is going to bind to the receptor, and then what we're going to talk about in a few minutes is the signal transduction pathway can happen in the target cell. So the target cell <clears throat> is the cell that has the receptor, that's receiving the signal. <clears throat> Again, what's happening in my body is I have some um, cells infected by this cold, probably called, caused by rhinovirus, and these viruses are infecting cells, and what's actually happening is these cells are producing a signal molecule, a ligand, that tells some of my T cells, hey, we're infected, come kill me. Kind of an interesting concept, but it's better to kill the cell that's infected with virus than to let the virus infection go and get me even more sick. This is just another example of contact-dependent signaling, or I should say two examples. This is not something you need to know, but what it's an example of an image I could give you. And what you want to see here is that the cells are connected by proteins on the surface. So the cell, this guy, delta, is actually the ligand. And this notch is the receptor, and you wouldn't know that, except that <coughs> as we talk about um, signal transduction, you can see that things are happening in this cell. So this cell is receiving the signal. Over here, <coughs> it's showing um, another, another way to show it, the delta S ligand. So this cell is expressing the ligand, the signaling molecule, and this cell is expressing the receptor. And in case you're wondering, <clears throat> notch signaling, you can see notch, notch, this is a way for neurons to develop and signal each other. But the key is that there is some kind of connection, not membrane to membrane, but ligand to receptor connection between two cells. Okay. A third and fourth type of signaling is autocrine and paracrine. So you're going to see this ending, crine, that's talking about cell communication. 
the auto and para are telling you what kind of <clears throat> cell-cell communication. Auto means self. So what I want you to see when you're analyzing this image <clears throat> is that the guy in the middle here is expressing the receptor and there are other cells nearby that are expressing the same receptor and this guy is making these signaling molecules that are released into the environment. <coughs> okay, This is working nearby, so all of these types of signaling we've been talking about <coughs> excuse me, is local. So let's just look back really quick. <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so direct intracellular signaling. is an example of local. Okay, short distance. These guys are interacting with each other very close. Um, contact dependent is local. And you're going to see I'm going to contrast that with long distance signaling in a minute. So, really close contact here at cell to cell. The difference between autocrine and paracrine is that the ligand is secreted or means put out into the environment. And then nearby cells can receive the signal. So the difference between autocrine and paracrine is autocrine can stimulate itself and its neighbors. <clears throat> right? So you see here the, the cell that's producing the signal, the signal is going out into the environment and then it's interacting with itself and it's interacting with the neighboring cells. Paracrine is neighbors only. So what I want you to see that's different in this figure is that the cell that's producing <coughs> the signaling molecule does not have the receptor and so it's not being stimulated by this information. Only the neighboring cells with the receptor. An example of when autocrine happens is the signal to divide, so to make more cells, especially after an injury. So you fall down, you scrape your leg, <coughs> and then you need to repair. And so the signals are going to say, divide, 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 hey, I'm going to divide too. So everybody's going to divide and repair that. Um, wound. An example of paracrine signaling is between neurons. So neurons communicate to other neurons and they release signaling molecules into the environment and this is very local so let's put, I forgot to put down here local. <coughs> Oops. Local signaling so nearby, <clears throat> and one neuron is releasing chemicals, and here in this case are the receptors like little squares, they do the receptors as blue, little half circles there. <clears throat> and so the signaling molecule is going from one cell to another that's very close by. Super important in cell biology is to understand cell signaling. Just so you know what's happening here, this is an example of a type of antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication that are called SSRIs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And so what normally happens, and you don't have to know this, I'm just giving you an example, <clears throat> is that serotonin, the ligand, so serotonin would be the ligand, is released and 
the serotonin receptors bind it, and a signaling pathway happens in the receiving neuron. If you're someone like me who doesn't produce enough serotonin, <clears throat> you take an uptake in, oh, and sorry, so what happens is that the serotonin is then taken back into the cell, not for a cell signal, but for storage. So if you're like me and don't make enough serotonin, we actually block this pathway with a drug, and so more serotonin can come out and interact with all these receptors, and I can be in a better mood. So we've talked about local, talked about <clears throat> intercellular, contact-dependent, autocrine, and paracrine signaling. The last type of signaling we're going to talk about is endocrine, and this is long distance. This is the only one that's long distance. <clears throat> this is usually hormones. And I want you to know that hormones can be lipid-based, or they can be protein-based. And we'll talk a little bit about that difference in a sec. What's important to understand here <clears throat> is that the cell that is secreting the hormone signals, this is usually some kind of gland in your body, and then <clears throat> the signal travels in the bloodstream. So signaling molecule The ligand travels through the bloodstream to a target cell or target tissue. So this is long distance. These cells are not <coughs> close by each other in the body. <coughs> Excuse me. So Endocrine is our example of long distance signaling. So you'll look for a hormone, you'll look for something that travels through the bloodstream, you'll look for the idea of long distance. And here the same thing though is happening. You'll have a target cell that expresses the receptor <coughs> and binds to the ligand and you'll have the signaling pathway happen. <coughs> okay. So this is how cells communicate between each other. What is really happening inside the cell with the receptor? What? So what is happening <coughs> inside the cell with the receptor? So the first thing I want you to remember is we have a ligand. And we have a receptor. And like I said, this is a very specific interaction. Oops. Okay, so I'm drawing these receptors with different shapes. Okay. And maybe you have a ligand like this, but no receptor. Or maybe you have a receptor that has a shape like this, but no ligand. So over here, there is no signal happening because there's either no receptor or no ligand. <clears throat> the circle ligand cannot stimulate the square receptor. So this is trying to explain the idea of specificity. 
So we have a signaling molecule, the ligand, on the receptor, which <coughs> can be transmembrane protein. Protein, or it can be internal. And this link down here is just a really short um, click through animation that kind of explains signaling transduction or the stages of cell signaling that we're going to talk about next. <clears throat> so there's three stages of cell signaling. The first one is reception, or I like to say receptor activation, which just means the ligand and the receptor are binding, they're interacting. Okay. So what I want you to understand is all of this that we're talking about here, this is happening inside the target cell. I almost wrote cell like Target's going to sell me something. Target cell, okay? So, if you look back here, target cell. Now we're talking about reception, then we're going to talk about signal transduction, and then we're going to talk about cellular response. If you look here, we're talking about reception, signal transduction, cell response. So remember this part now, we're going inside the target cell to see what happens when it binds the receptor. So we get receptor activation, and I'm going to jump to the next slide really quick. Receptor activation means that <clears throat> the receptor changes shape in order to pass on the signal. A really important concept in biology is <clears throat> um, structure equals function. So right now, the structure of the ligand, uh, sorry, the structure of the receptor is to be inactive. And when it changes structure, it has a new function, and now it's activated. So you're going to hear structure equals function a lot. <clears throat> so receptor activation, the ligand binds, you get a conformational change, the receptor is activated, and it's ready to interact with the next molecule. Okay. The second part is signal transduction, or the movement of the signal, let me put this in quotes, um, from protein to protein, or molecule, some aren't, aren't actually proteins that transfer the signal <coughs> to the next protein or molecule. And again, these relay molecules are going to change shape as they pass the signal on. So the little um, animation here kind of shows that it's really hard to get a good animation, but I want you to know um, a couple things. One, the signaling molecule does not cross into the cell, so we're not transferring the signaling molecule throughout the cell from protein to protein. but it's a, um, well, it's like playing telephone. You tell the next person something, they tell the next person something, they tell the next person something. Um, and so that's the relay of the message. Finally, the third is the cell response. What is the cell going to do? What's the action? that happens in the cell due to 
this signal. So let's take a look at some cell signaling examples. So what this is showing you again <coughs> are the three steps. Receptor activation. So the receptor is here and it's inactive. And then it's binding the signaling molecule and causing a conformational change. So the shape has changed. The signaling molecule stays outside of the cell. And I don't know why they did it this way. This should be number three. This should be number two. Next, signal transduction. <clears throat> the activated receptor stimulates a series of proteins that form a pathway. So this protein tells this protein what to do, and this guy tells this guy what to do. And the third part is the cell response. So what is the cell going to do? Well, maybe it's going to make an enzyme or activate an enzyme that's going to metabolize, you know, break down some sugars or make some um, proteins. Maybe it tells the cytoskeleton it's time to move. And so the microtubules and the actin and filaments might grow. Maybe <coughs> the cell response is to change gene expression. So maybe it says, okay, I need these proteins made, or <clears throat> I need these molecules made by the cell. So the cell response can be variable, but it's always going to be these three main steps inside the target cell. Now, I mentioned that sometimes there's intracellular receptors so receptors inside the cell. Okay. So in fact, here's the receptor. This is estrogen. And we've talked about how um, these <coughs> lipid-based hormones can go right on through the membrane, so right over here. And it, this estrogen is actually going into the nucleus and binding this receptor. And you can see the receptor has changed and the activated receptor in this case is going to turn on gene expression. So we have estrogen diffuses across the plasma membrane. Estrogen is going by simple diffusion <coughs> right across the plasma membrane and into the nucleus. The Signal transduction pathway is pretty small here. There's not a lot involved, but we still get um, a cell response that turns on a gene and produces a new protein. So remember to be able to recognize your steroids, just estrogen. We talked about, um, mentioned testosterone. Um, cortisol is also a steroid hormone. That's your stress hormone. So when you have too much stress, you have different cell responses. This is, again, not for you to memorize. You'll learn a lot about this in cell biology. Um, what I want to show you is some of the concepts we've learned about in class such as this activated G protein, if you can see here, I wish I could, I can't zoom in. Um, this is a lipid anchored protein. Okay. Um, over here, you have, looks like, some peripheral proteins. So I can't tell if it's all part of a transmembrane protein. You definitely have your transmembrane receptor. And then this is just trying to show you how the signal is passed on. So in this case, ATP is formed into cyclic a AMP. Cyclic AMP interacts with phosphokinase A. That activates that protein, and we go on and on and on. So that's our signal transduction pathway. Finally, I suggest you watch this um, few-minute video. Make sure it's 
breaking, um, on epinephrine. It's a really cool video about, um, and how long? Only four and a half minutes. Um, that talks about how this um, signaling molecule, epinephrine, which is a protein based hormone. And so if you hear the word hormone, hopefully you're thinking, oh, long distance. Right? So your body produces epinephrine, it goes throughout the bloodstream and can affect many different um, organs. So it can affect, affect your lungs, your heart rate, um, your skin, your blood vessels, <coughs> your muscle cells, your salivary glands, your pupils, your eye. So this is an example of how one signaling molecule can cause many different responses depending on the cell type. So it depends on, even though it's the same signaling molecule, you can have different types of receptors that are going to have different pathways. So let's go th check through the outcomes and make sure we've covered everything. So describe in general the concept of cell communication. Okay, so at the beginning we talked about this idea that cells can communicate, they can respond to their environment through chemical signals. And it's important so that cells, like I said, can respond to their environment. Maybe they get nutrients. Maybe they need to fight an infection. Maybe they need to increase your heart rate so you can run away from Bigfoot. Explain how each of the different types of cell-cell communication work and be able to determine the type of cell communication based on given information. So this means that we've gone through examples and you've looked at pictures of direct contact dependent autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine. Be able to read a description of one of these and determine what kind of signaling. So what I want you to do is not only be able to look at images and identify the type of signaling, but also you explain or I explain a type of signaling and you know which terms it goes with. <clears throat> Why are signal transduction and pathways important to cells? Think about this. It kind of goes back to Oh, it kind of is the same thing. Well, I guess signal transduction, I should say, is more of the internal part. <clears throat> but that's important for the same reason, sorry, to respond to the environment, um, to deal with infections, to know when to divide, all that good stuff. Be able to draw and explain the three stages, so we've covered that, receptor activation, signal transduction, cell response. Understand that receptors interact with signals, which we also call ligands, to produce a cell response. Remember I mentioned that the signal isn't literally moved through the cell. The signaling molecule, um, if it's interacting with a, a membrane-bound protein on the outside, is not going to come into the cell. But the signal is moved by proteins interacting um, in a pathway. Different types of cells can respond differently to the same signal, so it all depends on the receptor you have and the signal transduction pathway you have. <clears throat> okay. And this is really well illustrated in that epinephrine four and a half minute video. And finally, explain why cells only respond to specific signals. So think of what does a cell need in that target cell to <clears throat> respond to the signal. Okay, that's all I got for you. Thank you.